everybody, I'm Ashley Graham, and this is Pretty Big Deal, where confidence is key. Every episode, I get to pick the brains of brilliant, inspiring, honest, new and old friends who are a pretty big deal. Today, we are talking to the amazing Paloma El Cesar. You can catch her on the runways and working with brands like Glossier, Nike, and Fenty Beauty. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we have Paloma El Cesar on with us here, on yeah. with us today. I said it right, right? You said it right, and I'm so proud of you. Okay, first of all, the debacle about your last name. I know, I know. It's a lot. It's honestly just syllables, El Cesar. Yeah, and it looks, It's that's the way that it's spelled. I just think that the S's really get everyone stressed. <laughs> Like, I feel that. Like, they'll be like, Elsner. I don't know where that's from, but okay. I'm going to take literally every bank person ever. Hi, Miss Elser. They just, they're just like, I can't. Like, it's essentially like a give up in the middle, but it's okay. Okay, so Context, this is like you. My grandfather is Swiss, and there's a county, a French county in Switzerland called Elsass. So that's where it comes Interesting. from. Interesting. Yeah, we yeah. were all wondering. Sure. <laughs> right, yes. Well, I just, I want to start off with something that you had said when we were together and we were talking at 2018's um, Vogue Fashion Forces. Mm-hmm. And it was about how different, but how, how many commonalities you and I have. And one of the direct quotes was, Ashley and I are very different women. We have different identities, different experiences, but we are we have a connection. And it really hit home for me because it's true. You can't put a big girl in a category, and that's what fashion has done. And I want to talk about that with you today. And I want to talk about tokenism and like what all of that means to you. Yeah. I mean, I think especially coming fresh out of fashion week, it's alarming to know that like posed against the majority of girls that, you know, were sprinkled into that like a lot of these major fashion heads like not only like confuse us, but like think we're the same person. Not just you, but like me and like another curve girl yeah. and another curve. And like, we couldn't be different. And more exactly. Different. Like I had in one encounter where the, the woman was like, we've worked together. And I was like, I would remember, but I didn't want to just say like, no, we haven't. So it's like a new level of microaggression where one, I've interacted with everyone thinking that like every, you know, black girl, every Hispanic girl is the same. But it's like now, because our opportunities are slimmer, no pun intended, <laughs> but like that we're all the same, you know? But I think that historically, especially in like the curve market, that we're having this like radical shift in really just representing for different iterations of what a curve or plus size or fat or chunky girl can look like. The common theme for us is always like, how do we like work in service of allowing young, specifically young women to see themselves? Because themselves is all of us. Yeah. It's you, it's me, it's her, it's everybody. What is your feeling on the whole, I mean, the word plus size. I mean, this is one of those questions that I hate. Always. It's I like, hate yeah. it. I hate this question. I know. How do you feel about it? I mean, and I've kind of said this before. I just kind of use it as an armor in a way because a lot of plus girls who's had like their first season and it's like coming up to the suit or coming up to the show and like checking in and then being like hair or makeup, you know? Oh, how many Are times sub- does that happen to me? I know. I'm, it's insane. And so it's like, okay, how do I allow myself not to be subject to like that weird like furrow of the brow when I'm like, oh, I'm a model, which I shouldn't have to feel. Mm-mm. But I also shouldn't have to feel badly when I have to explain to someone. So I kind of just use it where I'm just like, look, I'm a, a plus model. Like, because it just kind of reduces the the margin of discomfort. So for you, it's not really about being categorized. It's just, it's your armor. Yeah, it's just You would rather not be in a label. It would just, I, of course, I would rather not be in a label. Like, I want, because I we work really hard. I work personally really hard at just being, like, producing good work, feeling respected in an industry that for so long I never thought would include me. So it's like, I don't want to be devalued or reduced to a label, you know? Like, I also want the same treatment. I want the same clothes. I want the same experiences as a model. So I should be able to just say, I'm a model. But we have yet to experience the whole spectrum of the same clothes and the same experiences. 
So I want to first dive into how you were discovered because, again, completely opposite stories. Yeah. I was in a mall Correct. 20 years ago when social media wasn't even around. Yeah. And your story is the exact opposite. Can you tell yeah. us about it? Well, I even say, I'm like, I wasn't discovered in a mall. Like, I literally <laughs> say, you're like, fine quotes. I was essentially like, it was a like kind of compounded. A fashion editor named Stevie Dance who works at Pop Magazine. I, at the time, was working at a t-shirt store and like, just would hang out with a bunch of skaters and she would see me around. She was like, hey, you like really pretty. Like, she's Australian. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering yeah, Australian or like, English. Yeah, she's like, you're like really, you know, and yeah. I at the time had like, I never, I didn't know anything about the plus size industry. I didn't know that it was lucrative. In my lifetime, I didn't really wear the clothes just because I w started wearing like men's clothes and just kind of like finding things that worked from a really young age. So I didn't really know about the breadth of like, everything that was happening. You know, I saw, like, the crystal wrens of the world. Of but even then, I was like, that's so sick, but that wasn't, like, me. So when Stevie was like, you should take some pictures and I'll set you up with people and, like, you can make money. Like, there's things happening. Like, there's things changing. There's this girl, Ashley Graham, who's doing things. For real? Yes. And I was that's like, so what? Funny. And I remember seeing you in the Love magazine. It was that. It was Stevie. And then I had gone on a tour bus with my one of my best friends. I was tour managing him because I was like, Whatever. Wait, you were a tour manager? I was helping tour manage uh, my friend Earl Sweatshirt. He's like my one of my oldest friends. He's like my brother's best friend. So okay. it was kind of just this like, that's very much so my personality. Just like, let's try it out. Like, let's see what's up. So I went and then I remember getting an email from somebody being like, Pat McGrath, like legendary makeup artist, wants to shoot you for her makeup line. So I was like, uh, okay, I guess I got to leave Lollapalooza or wherever I was and got on a train. Pat paid for my train to go back and we shot Gold Zero Zero One. What? That's the first person who had like professionally really done my makeup. Like I had no idea. I had no point of reference. So you show up on set and yeah. you've never even been on a set like that before. Never in my life. Like, was there other people that were not models or were you surrounded by it, supermodels at that point? It was also just me. What? Yeah, it was just me. I she think. had never met you and she casted you? Yeah. I literally walk in. I'm like nervous. Like, I don't know about expressions or like move. I just, <laughs> I'm like, hey, like never done my makeup before like that. Like, and it's actually been this incredible point of reference for me is that like my very first like major shoot with her, like she didn't change anything about me. You know, she wasn't like do anything than who you are. Like you're here because like literally not because you're plus, but because you're like a beautiful canvas for my makeup. Mm. And that's why I want you here. I didn't know that that wasn't normal. <laughs> like, it's not normal. It's not. And it still isn't normal. Yeah. The way that you were discovered is incredibly unique. Yeah. I think it's very much so, like, definitive of the times. It's, like, also leading up to it, it's like, yeah, I think she had seen my Instagram. I just always used Instagram to kind of talk shit, kind of, in a way. Or, like, <laughs> you know, whatever. Like, wear the outfit. Or like, what? not outfits. Just, like, weird things. Like, to this day, I still post weird things. And so I did that and it'll be like, Oh, we're going to get into your Instagram. Oh my God. <laughs> but like, yeah, like, I don't know. I just was like, cool. It'll be like me and some dickies or like me with like a red lip. Like I just was like honest because I wasn't performing for anybody at all. So you had no idea that your social media was kind of like your business card at this point. I had no idea. Absolutely no idea. But then there would be like little things that would happen. Like I, before that I had done like a, you know, a couple little shoots, but it was like, people were like, oh, I'm going to give you $350. And I was like, I'm rich. <laughs> I'm rich. Who wants dinner? Because I got $350 in one day. Like, I was a deer in the headlights. Like, I had no idea. So we can add a bunch of zeros to your salary now, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, You're I'm, doing not, well. I'm, I'm doing great. Thank you, Vina White. <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm, I, which is like also just been such an incredible, teachable moment um, in self-worth and understanding how to take care of myself. Like when you don't have any like kind of financial foreground, like you're kind of launched into like a thing, you know, and it's hard. It's the biggest thing finance is getting into modeling. Yeah. Because some people are really lucky. Like they can call their parents about all these things. Like are not unfortunately. No, you supersede that. Yeah. Okay. So let's take it back, like way back. To yeah. when you're like 11, 12 years old yeah. and you really wanted some embroidered jeans from The Gap. Oh my God, you dug for this story. <laughs> you see this too? <laughs> I, I know everything. 
everything. Yes, everything. But, but I I I have similar experiences, but I want I want you to tell yours and and about that day. Yeah. I mean, I remember I went to Kids Gap. I was 11. I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Um at that point, I had kind of like I guess now looking back at it, like I had body. Like I already had body. It was already happening. Body, I had yaddy, boobs. Baby. I had body. Like it was all happening and I go to the gap because every girl in my class has these like embroidered like kids gap jeans and I go and there's just nothing that fits. Like <sighs> nothing. It's a non-stretched like flared embroidered jean. I remember the lighting. I remember exactly what that dressing room looks like. And I remember being there. It's also like I'm shopping with my dad who's just mm-hmm. like doesn't I don't think he knew how to, like, navigate it. And I remember this poor saleswoman frantically running around and then, like, oscillating between, like, the adult gap trying to find... And, like, nothing was fitting. It literally felt like... Because adult clothes wouldn't fit fit, you, right? Yeah. No. At that point, when you're 11, like, obviously I've experienced lower points in my life. But, like, that felt like one of the lowest points. Like, I just was, like, I had already felt this extreme isolation in my identity since I was a kid for like a multitude of reasons like my mom's African-American my dad is Chilean and Swiss but like grew up in the UK and he has dreads so it's like his identity is like all mixed up and then my mom it's like black but like also Buddhist and like grew up super hippie so and then I just ended up going to quite like prestigious school surrounded by nobody that like on a class level I could identify with and then I was fat like I just was like god help me <laughs> like I felt really alone in wow. my body wow like really alone and so just that physical like representation of just like not fitting in literally felt like I couldn't go lower like that's why that memory is so clear to me because I remember that feeling Mm. of just like I'm never gonna fit in it's never gonna work for me you know it's crazy what happened (sighs) with you girl (laughs) no I mean like there's just I mean it's it's like I can identify because at 11 12 years 12 years old is when I started modeling and I was considered a plus size model at that time yeah and and you go I mean similar situation it's like you can only shop at a few different places but now you have identity in your style. I do. And before you got here, I was telling my whole crew, I was like, you don't know cool until you meet Paloma. <laughs> There's just always something about how you carry yourself. And I want to know how you got there. Because being the young girl at Gap who hated that experience, and it in some ways maybe felt like it defined you at that time. But now you can walk into a room and Regardless if you're insecure walking into the room, you you have this aura about you that is like, I am who I am. And you're unapologetically yourself. And I want to know how you got there. A lot of our experiences or just anybody who has operated as any kind of minority or different from the norm, that all of those insecurities become ultimately your strength. My biggest strength and like people are like, how do you know how to shop? It's like, because I've been chunky my whole life. (laughs) Like, that's how I know, you know? And I just had an attitude shift. And not to say that, like, every day is, like, easy in that, but I've always liked to express myself through style. And all of those things have now formed how I get dressed today in that, like, just knowing my body and having holding space for it and how I'm feeling. And so if I hold space for it, that that's where, like, the confidence kind of comes through, where it's like, if today I'm hoodie and a baggy pair of Carhartts and a boot, like, that's who I am today, and that's it. And that's, like, the common thread. And then on top of it, yeah, like, knowing what I feel good in. I'm normally, if I'm going to do a tight top, I'm going to do, like, a baggy bar or something, you know, just... Right. But I've done, that's been my recipe for so long because it was, like, my tools for su- survival, all the girls when I'm in middle school are wearing what was like the jeans, like Frankie B and like paper denim and cloth and like old seven jeans. And you know, oh, do you remember? Girl, like, I'm right. 31. Okay. And you're 26. <laughs> I'm 27. Oh, 27. So, I mean, it's not that it's not big, big of a gap, but yeah. enough because I grew up in Nebraska. Right. I grew up in LA. LA. So. <laughs> There's a whole difference. <laughs> Right. So in LA, so what's a Frankie B there was, there, in LA, there was this huge phase of like these $250 jeans that I could. Oh. For a bunch of different reasons, couldn't work out. That was just not how I wouldn't have been able to afford them. But then I was like, oh, but I could afford maybe like the tank top that of the brand that the girls were wearing. So it's like, okay, I'm going to wear uh, a Dickie 
with this tank top and all, you know, so I just always kind of like, and I don't know, you can ask any of my oldest friends, they're like, oh, Paloma always just dressed how she wanted to dress, you know, like given, I think there was a, there was definitely a prickly period where I was like, I felt that my body was like, my sexuality hadn't connected. Like I felt my body was too sexual when I wasn't even really like overtly sexual. So it made me uncomfortable, like being 11 and 12 and having grown men looking at me like I was an adult. That's the other thing. Yeah. So I just was like, yeah, like I, I want to cover it up. Not because I felt, I did feel uncomfortable in my body, but I felt more uncomfortable in like being subject to other discomfort. Mm hmm and then slowly, then there was, like, this kind of, like, unapologetic version of my body with sexuality, you know? And it's just all a byproduct. Like, today, how I, like, move through the world are just, like, a byproduct of, like, hardship or, like, struggles that have now just informed. It's amazing. Yeah. You I'm know? so glad you explained that. I think it's also really important for our industry because, you know, it's not about, like, being, like, you know, like, a blogger or, like, a style. I, but it's, like, it is hard for us to find the clothes that represent us well. Mm -hmm. Like, it's truly difficult. It's important for young people to see women like us dressed how we really actually want to dress. Mm -hmm. Not how we, we have, have to, to dress, dress because the clothes are supposed are to dress. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So even when I feel like, oh, like, whatever, I have to be you know of service in some way because I was like damn I really do wish that I had a better example growing up where I had to, I had to just make all the mistakes mm -hmm. I'm like girl like yeah like that mini skirt and that little tank top looks different on you than it does your friend of course always and I had to like figure that out uh, the hard the way. hard way be the girl you didn't have yes, yes. tell us what that means I know what it means yeah because you know what it means because I live it I right? want it yeah. <laughs> yeah I just I just never not only like saw myself but I just you know it's very important for me to as I say constantly just cater to the nuances of the identities that we can all represent you know I didn't see a girl who like dressed the way that I wanted to I felt always very like that I had to be some like performative sexy girl that like I didn't I never actually feel entirely comfortable in it until, like, the last few years of my life. So just, you know, that you can be intelligent. Like, you can have a critique. Like, you can be uncomfortable. You can be transparent in that. I also remember being younger and being very ashamed of, like, thinking the way that I did. Or, to, you know, I remember that, literally having a memory of being, like, sound dumber. Like, just, like, be a girl who could just, like, giggle. And, like, like that you can be loud, that you can, like, take up space. Like, I always felt just because my physical body took up so much space that mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to shrink. And that, like, I wanted to see more. Because all of, like, the most incredible icons to me are women now that just, like, unapologetically taking up space yes. in the ways that were just, like, who they were. That's kind of what I will try and echo through. Be the girl you be didn't have. Be the girl have. I didn't have. I love that so much. Yeah. You've had your own experiences, personally, good, mm -hmm. bad, and ugly. Mm -hmm. But now here you are on set, and you have other people dressing you. And, you know, as a model, we don't get a choice what yeah. we're wearing. Right. What have those experiences been like for you? I mean, I've had kind of like an assortment of experiences. I also think that— Are you still running into discrimination? And in, in, I just— Or I, are you running into discrimination? It's discriminatory to get onto set and, like, our rack is this big and it's, like, all, like, clothes that we would never wear. It's not main fashion. And then the other girls have, like, racks and racks of Prada, Mew Mew and Mugler and, like, all these things. Like, it's passively discriminatory. I mean, I do feel actually really lucky that now I'm in a position in my career where it's like I have more of a say than I ever thought that I would. Mm -hmm. Why Instagram, for instance, is a powerful tool in also representing who you are, where it's like on a visuals level, like the stylist, the people can also see that like, yeah, like I know how to, I, like I find the things, so should you. Mm -hmm. And then it's like they come in and like, oh, like you're so cool. We love your outfit. We love your style. But don't you hate it then? They ask you to bring clothes <laughs> oh, to set. I'm saying. I hate the that shit. The amount of shit I've had to tow on my back. Oh, I say no. Yeah. Like I've had some, yeah, kind of like passive 
microaggressions around our bot my body. Like, I remember being on um, when we were shooting Vogue Arabia cover. Mm-hmm. Oh my god! We were upstate New York. We did some doubles and then we did some singles. And I had gone back to change. And you were coming back and you had this like look on your face, like something had just happened. And I was like, Paloma, is everything okay? You said, no, not everything's okay. I just, I I don't, I don't like what just happened. It was the outfit that didn't fit. Yeah. And it didn't fit me. Yeah. And so they were like, oh, we'll put it in Paloma. Yeah. And it was uncomfortable. Yeah. Like we're always like naked and oiled up or... Or we're, Worse. like, smashed into shit that, like, just doesn't look good. It's, like— Jamming. Jamming. Mm-hmm. It's also, like, let's not forget that we're, like, also trying to sell clothes. Mm-hmm. So then you feel then this—I I felt in that moment this overwhelming responsibility to make something that wasn't working and wasn't going to work, work. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of situations, I can make it work. But in that, like, I was just like, this lining, like, they don't get it. Like, lining is a (sighs) fat girl's literal nightmare. I cut lining out of everything. Everything. (laughs) Everything. It was just like other stylists or other people on set being like, it looks good. And I'm like, it doesn't. You knew they were lying to you. I knew they were lying. Mm -hmm. And it upset me. It felt dishonest. And it didn't feel that, like, you know, that it was a collaboration, which now, not now and not always, but lately, in a lot of jobs I've been on, I felt really, it's a collaboration. It's like, Mm -hmm. how do you feel? Do you like the way you look? Do you like the way you look? Would you wear this? I know. And thank God we are at the place where we are in our career, but it really sucks for the girls who are on the rise right now who don't have a voice. And I always tell models, stand up for yourself. Who cares if you hate something? Say it. Now, if it's just about the style, that's one thing. That's one thing. But like, if it's like, if you really feel uncomfortable in something, stand up and talk about it. Right. I had a um, a really big stylist actually grab my the side of my butt right here. Justin, my husband, he calls mm-hmm. it side butt. It's gorgeous. And- <laughs> I actually love that. You're always like, this is my part. I'm like, that's hot. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't fit into these Raph Simmons pants. And she grabbed that part of my ass, my hip, and said, darling, if you would just get rid of this, then you could fit into it. This was a year ago. I said, ma'am, you know who I am. You know what I stand for. Mm -hmm. And you know that I'm not going to lose weight to fit into these pants. Absolutely not. And those experiences, no matter at what level we're at, there will always be there. And I feel a responsibility to constantly stand up for myself and for the people around me because when I was younger, I didn't have that. I didn't mm-hmm. know that that was okay. Mm-hmm. And we have to do it. We have to. I mean, it's funny because you have to walk into those situations. I mean, I do personally, for sure, I have to think about like what the effect of my doing being there at all or what behind closed doors goes on like how will it affect someone else's experience actually mm-hmm. I was talking about yesterday like to, to have you met Ugbad yet no Ugbad she's like she's like a beautiful she wears a hijab we were both on the same plane flying back from Nigeria and we had just like we had followed each other on Instagram I mean she's like a baby deer like born to model like born to model Aww. We're talking, and then I just, like, was able to just, like, with real sincerity be like, don't let anybody rock your faith and who you are. Just because they're gay doesn't mean you can change in front of them. Because it's kind of quiet doesn't mean that you have to show your hair to anyone. It doesn't matter how many shoots it is. You can take as long as you want off for Ramadan because you putting your foot down for yourself will create that space for every Muslim girl after to demand the same thing. Mm. Like, every single time I'm like— I'll challenge a stylist and be like, where's the things? Like, how about, there's a tailor over there. Why don't we open it up? You know, or just like, no, I don't personally want to be, have my hair and baby hairs and like door knockers, you know, because that will create space for another brown or black girl to be like, I'm I'm not cool with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is there a black or brown person shooting it? No. Is there a black or brown person doing my hair? No. Which is also the new thing that it's like the... As you can see, the majority of my crew is women, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and now you're seeing majority of crews being a POC yeah. people of color. Like it's yeah. it's happening, and it's really, we're able to demand it now. Absolutely, absolutely. Take me back. Yeah, not as far back as eleven, 11. Or twelve. <laughs> this is just a few years right. ago, 2017. Glossier, you're nude. You're on set. Yes. 
take us back to that morning of that shoot and what you thought walking into it. I honestly thought that, like, I was more prepared. Up until that point, I hadn't shot nude, like, for a huge thing. Like, I've shot nude with, like, different, like, friends for, like, different things. Up until that point, I also was, like, very insecure about one specific part of my body, which were my breasts, which I didn't know how they were going to be photographed. Like, it ha- actually, my breasts were the one part of my body that really held me back from doing a lot of nude shoots, which was, like, really weird. It was the one... So, going into it, I was like, how am I going to be able to, like, figure this out? And then... I don't know. I got onto set and I felt completely overwrought with like the future mm. instead of the present. Like I was just like, you know, what are like my boyfriend's friends and my brother's friends and like all of this thing because I grew up also around a lot of boys and I knew how boys talk. So I was just like, I just was thinking about every possible wrong and I'm like, started getting really frustrated. So I started crying. I don't really cry when I'm sad. I honestly cry. I have, like, hot tear syndrome. Like, I'm, like, you know, at the Delta Terminal, like, I can't knock it on this flight. Like, crying, not because I'm sad, but because I'm mad. <laughs> so that's what, and I just, like, was spiraling about the future, you know? But then I had to kind of excuse myself and just, like, literally bring myself into the present and that the only important part of the future has nothing to do with those that will judge me, but those that will feel seen in this, mm. you know? And so I walked into it, like, at the time, the creative director was like, we can do anything that will, like, make you feel comfortable. We got everybody kind of off set. We, like, put, like, Sade on. And they just made me feel like that space was mine and mine only. And, yeah, it ended up being, like, a very, very powerful campaign and on billboards, (laughs) which I didn't know about. (laughs) But, yeah, like, it just really... And every anxiety that I was spiraling about the future, like, literally, like, fell away. Like, it was crazy that, like, every one of my, like, skater dude friends were like, dude, that's fucking sick. <laughs> like, they, you know, like, they were so hyped. And then, like, I don't know. And I just, I didn't even notice my boobs. I didn't even know. I just was like, well, they what? looked good. Thanks, babe. I just want to say thank you because you expressed yourself in a way that so many of us have felt for so long. That photo, even though it was a couple years ago, through this pregnancy, I have felt like in some ways shame because mm. my body is changing so quickly and it's un- not in my control. And I've always had control over my body. Mm-hmm. And I posted a photo from the side, similar side as your side. Mm for Glossier Mm -hmm. and it was just a selfie with stretch marks new new roles in my body Mm -hmm. that I have and I thought of you when I posted it because it was a very vulnerable moment for me Mm -hmm. and I thought it's so beautiful and all these girls then and it just yeah and it just creates a a a trip a a rippling effect of people feeling confident and did you know that you were gonna have that that effect on other women I didn't realize how important it was, how important it is for women like us to be included in beauty, for there to be, like, honest depictions of what beautiful women can look like. There was a lot of parts, but I just had to, like, relinquish control Mm -hmm. over that moment. And it was also, I guess, I didn't get to talk really candidly about the Glossier girls brought me into the studio before the photos went out and let me choose. <gasps> they did. You don't, what? You don't I understand know. what privilege you just had. I know. that okay. It's never happened again. For and anybody like, listening yeah. or watching, yeah. you do not get to that pick. That never happens. No model on the face of this earth. I mean, I don't even know if we asked Cindy Crawford if she ever no. got to pick a cover. Never. You never get never. to pick a photo. Ever. But I want to talk about your boobies. Yeah, my boobs. Because we had a very long conversation about your boobs on the phone. And yeah. it was just the two of us. It like, was. it was no cameras or microphones. No. And you told me about your boobs. And, yeah. And now you've done something to your boobs. Yeah. Um, so I got, like, a minor breast reduction but lift. Like, I reduced one. Um it was a very crazy experience. So was it that they were saggy and that's what you didn't like about Pre- them? Mainly, mainly, and I had some, like, severe asymmetry. Okay. I kind of developed breasts, like, really early, and not to say that I've ever been, like, extremely thin, but I've fluctuated a lot 
in my life as, you know, a, a lot of us have. But yeah, so my breasts <sighs> were like very subject to that. You know, I would make like leaps and bounds around like other parts of my body. Like, because there was a period of time in my life, like when I was young, where I could literally find flaw from like the top of my head. Like my hairline's weird to like my second toe is weird. Like I could find <laughs> something about everything. And it's not about this like radical, like, self-love for me it's around radical acceptance Mm. and I say this all the time but it's like yeah like the things that maybe that I felt isolated or uncomfortable in when I was younger it's like yeah like I can't control that I'm not white or that I wasn't thin or that I wasn't born rich like I can get rich but like you know but these things and it's like yeah like it's not in my narrative up until this point to be thin or to be quiet right or to be this thing so that's when you were like okay let me do something about my breasts yeah but the breath like I literally was just like these are things that I can you know and it was the one part of my body that I still felt shame around Mm. like in this even like my stomach I was like okay like it can be cute like you know whatever but it's like my breasts were the one part and I'm happy that I didn't do them when I had just gotten like my first check because at first I was like oh I'm gonna do it but I still felt that it would have been kind of a reaction or reflection of like you know how men receive me or how the industry received me and so I'm happy that I did it now at 27 where I've been committed loving holistic, honest relationship for almost five years where he loves me unchanged, you know? And then, like, my career wasn't affected. It was truly for me. I wanted to be able to move in the world and not have to go to work with three different bras Mm -hmm. and have to tape my boobs up every day. Like, I just... It was literally not even about just, like, how it looks. It's about the mental and emotional, like, taxation. Like, I just wanted that freedom. And are you happy now with your boob? It's never perfect, but I definitely feel grateful that it's not something that dictates how I feel every day. That's good. Just, yeah. That's incredibly important. I developed like a zine and a book and I partnered with one of my one of my close friends who's an amazing photographer with for really honest photos of what the experience really looks like, you know? And I don't have anything to hide. I mean, it's definitely not like screaming it from the rooftops, but I also think it's important because we live in a time where we see really modified bodies and we just normalize that that's like not only what like a body should look like, but also like, oh, but I could look like that if I got enough money. Mm. And like people have willingness and freedom to do whatever the fuck they want with their body and their money and anything. I have no judgment. So it's a photo series of the the progression after your breast augmentation? Yes. Okay, got it. Oh, I'm excited. Yeah, yeah. And there's like some writing stuff. It was also the first time that I had had to take like any kind of painkiller in a very long time because I don't drink or anything. Right. And so I wrote like a bunch of pieces on when I was like hot. Like it was, it's a very like raw and honest thing. That's, I'm excited for this. Yeah, I think. I'm excited. Because I mean, being pregnant right now, I'm like, right. so the breast lift is going to come <laughs> at which point so it, in my life? <laughs> it's, it's a part of it. It can be. It's been remarkable how you've shared your mental health um, story a little a little bit with us on social media, yeah, and um, anxiety and and how how social media can be a trigger. I want to talk about it with you a little bit because I think there's a lot of young people listening who go through similar situations. What are some of those things that that you're going through that you have been through, and how have you gotten through them? Yeah, I've struggled with mental illness since I was very young. Mm-hmm. Um, I was put on medication, I think, around 11. Oh, wow. Yeah, which and that was even after kind of a series of trying to find other, like, homeopathic remedies. Like I said, my mom is, like, super hippie. And even by 11, 12, I was really, really struggling. I had a very—I was a very anxious child, and I also was intelligent, but then I would operate at this, like, very, like, dogmatic, dark place. Mm. Like, it's hard to be, like, a child and think that, like— nothing good you know and so I was I was I felt very trapped Mm -hmm. in my own head and so medication definitely acted as a remedy in that I was in talk therapy CBT therapy to other different forms you know acupuncture like a whole spectrum of different kind of agents to help with those experiences of like isolation uncertainty powerlessness a lot of stuff that like we're very adult feelings to be mm-hmm. feeling at a really young age. And not to, And I would also like to echo that, like, it's not things that are quiet today for me. Mm-hmm. 
And then I use like kind of drugs and alcohol to kind of like remedy yeah. that that fear. Like I didn't really have the tools. And so throughout my adolescence and my early adulthood, it was always trying to like grab at just like finding how to have like agency over something that it's like not totally in my control. Like it's truly like a chemical imbalance and having to like put one foot in front of the other and just constantly have empathy for myself in that, you know? So I feel, and then it was hard because then it's like, then I stepped into an industry, which isn't exactly like a mirror of like holistic mental health practice. It is not. So I really had to s- rapidly adjust into a place that like made me feel like s- sane at a certain point. I've been off meds for a while now. And uh, you're sober now too, right? Yeah, and I've been sober for a long time. All of these things have played like huge, huge roles in what my version of like, I don't say happiness, but like content looks like today and gratitude Mm. because, and I think that also comes with just like a lot of transparency and a lot of honesty, you know, it's always been something that I'm like willing to talk about in the effort to like let everyone who may also feel that way. So the National Alliance of Mental Health estimates that 48 million U.S. people actually suffer from anxiety. Yeah. It's not easy being a young girl today. Mm. It's not. Like, it was not easy 50 years ago. It's not easy being a young girl at all mm-hmm. or a woman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, it is. You know, and I think that it comes with a lot of other, like, tyrannies that it's like, yeah, of course we're depressed. Of course we're anxious. And mm-hmm. I think— Holding space now for, like, I am an anxious person, but, like, what am I doing physically to, like, aid that, you know, in a way that feels safe for me, you know? And it's that from just, like, waking up, making my bed, reaching out to another person, making sure that someone, you know, like, these things that when I was younger I didn't have. So, of Mm. course, I went to other coping mechanisms. So, you've created your own kind of rituals. Yeah, totally. That's so important. It's so So, this is, like, you have a support system? 100%. And you also have your rituals. Yeah. And can you walk us through what those two things look like for you? My support system is a whole network of people, like, just keeping in contact with my family a lot. Your boyfriend? My boyfriend. You know, and also my boyfriend, my partner also not being responsible for every part of my feelings. Right. That was something that was really radical for me to figure out. It's okay for him not to be equipped to make me feel the best about. Like, that's Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. You know, knowing how to ask for help. Knowing how to voice, like, I feel scared about this. And creating an ecosystem of people that know how to how to we could can support each other in that like i texted mina all last week like i'm afraid of this that and the third and like she gave me tokens that i needed mina's our agent and our, she yeah. yeah and she is incredible when it comes to just like because she's also a big girl yeah she, and she understands the anxiety of like walking into a space where you're either going to be in lingerie yeah, on yeah. Her, like live tv yes, correct or just walking or being in a space where it's skinny Driven people everywhere, everywhere. Mm-hmm. yeah How has sobriety changed how you feel about yourself today? I just have trust around who I am, abstaining from a lot of things that happen for a lot of people in their 20s. Like, it's taught me a lot, you know? It's showed me to trust my gut. It's showed me how to be a person that people want to be around, Mm. you know? Like, it's... One of my most, and when any young model especially asks me, like, what what's some advice? I'm like, yeah, like, practice, like, do that. But it's really, like, be a person that people want around. It's so true. It's so, like, I can't explain how lucky I feel that, like, despite how dark fashion could, can be, like, I've made some incredible friendships and relationships. Like, how I knew that how much I loved Alistair McKim was, like, the first job we ever did. He asked me, how do you feel? I'd never been asked that by a stylist. Alistair is also such a sweetheart. He's an angel, you know? Like, he's asked me to be a contributing editor at ID because he trusts me. And, you know... Come on, Paloma. (laughs) But, yeah, you know, and it's, like, it's really beautiful. Like, Mm -hmm. it's really... I feel truly honored. Social media is a place where you're super candid and you're yourself and it's it's now turned into a business for you. Yeah. How is it managing it? Like you do it by yourself? Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. How, I mean, I, how? I know. Because kind of tying back to like the mental health stuff, um, I got into kind of a dark place where I forgot like why I use social media, why I used it. Specifically the girls or the women that like rely on me. Like they're there because it's like, they like my weird photos of like cars and like railings and like it's weird like things. weird, but it's cool. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm like double tap. I don't know what that is, but I like it. <laughs> so, what is Paloma currently passionate about? Well, two things. It's like when somebody, asks, if someone wants to ask me five years ago, like, what's your five year plan? It would be like a hundred percent about career. Mm. And today. It's about 10% about career. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Like, it's definitely that, but I just want that 10% to be so that it, like, permeates into the other 90% of my life that, like, I can live with contented, you know what I mean? Because I've learned in this industry that, like, there is no, like, top. Mm -hmm. And then there's people at the top who are still very unhappy In a very physical way, like, I just want to have things, and you've been an incredible role model and just having things sustained in ways where it's like you don't, you know, that our bodies don't have to always be our trade. No. You know, that, like, you can represent yourself. There's more to us. There's more, you know, and I think that that's, like, something that I'm really excited to step into. Like, clothing, I just, we just constantly are reminded of this, like, the lack of it, and I don't want to, like— I need you to make this. this. (laughs) Well, you can talk Who to uh, Jean Paul Gaultier. About <laughs> See, she comes in and Jean Paul freaking Gaultier. Yeah. I think okay, so on Pretty Big Deal, what we do at the end is a lightning round, mm-hmm. and I just need you to fill in the blank. Okay. All right. I pretty much always. I pretty much always lotion my body. <laughs> Sorry, like I'm just. But you guys don't understand. Her body is so soft. (laughs) I can't go. It's like my tick. I can't not put lotion. We have had to intertwine many times in photos, and I'm always like, Paloma, your skin, your like. I want to take a nap on you. Always in moisturized, girl. It's real. (laughs) What's the biggest lesson you've learned in the past year? The biggest lesson I've learned in the past year is what I didn't get wasn't for me. Oh, I learned that. Yeah. Hardcore. Yeah. Isn't it a thing? It's, it's a thing. I'm like, oh, like, it, that wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Was it a big job? A cover? Cover or just like, yeah. It was a few things? A few, like, different things. Like, last week, I'm like, it w- it's carried me through this week. Mm-hmm. Being like, why not? You know, because the first thought is like, why not me? But I'm like, what wasn't, what didn't happen for me wasn't meant for me. Mm-hmm. It's a very important lesson that a yeah. lot of people need to still yeah. realize. Okay, and finally. Hit me. I mean, I only have pretty big deals on the podcast, Pretty Big it's Deal. True. But I want to know what is a pretty big deal to you? Um, I guess speaking to what I was saying, empathy is a pretty big deal to me. It's mm-hmm. really, it's a, an, an important tenant to how I connect with people you know just empathy empathy it's big it's a big one. one it's pretty big deal you know people like to forget about it she's deep y'all <laughs> she's deep for many reasons and uh, i love it thank you oh so much you, paloma el so cesar you got it yeah really good i'm really proud of you and thank you to all of you guys who are watching pretty big deal make sure you go to instagram and twitter and comment because we want to know what you thought of this interview. We also want to hear your thoughts and um, comments for Paloma, for me. And I mean, maybe you're feeling the same way. So we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks for listening and watching. 